Okay, kids, we've got a question for you today. What is faith? What is faith? I suppose uh, it's kind of a question we could ask everyone because adults and kids need to come to an understanding of what it means to have faith. So what is faith? Well, the Bible uh, defines it actually in Hebrews chapter 11 in the first verse when it says that it's being sure of the things we hope for. That is, that we look forward to in Jesus and being certain of the things that we have not seen. That is, like his resurrection, that we believe that and we trust in that. We have faith in that. But I want to think about it even a little bit perhaps beyond the verse of Scripture to what is the substance of faith? What is it that uh, makes faith? So kids... What is faith? I brought a chair along out of my office. Now, it's a rather old chair. It's been around a long time, longer than anyone else here. I don't know uh, who's the oldest of us, but even if I add your two ages together, uh, this chair exceeds the combination. So this chair has been around a very long time, 200 plus years it's been around. Now, it looks pretty sturdy, wouldn't you say? I mean, if it's lasted 200 years, it must have proved something about being sturdy. Uh, it looks solid. It looks strong. Uh, we can look at it, and we can kind of uh, assess it, and we can, in our minds, in the knowledge of our heads, we can say, it looks like a very reputable chair and one that we could sit in, right? I see everybody's heads nodding, the young heads and the old heads. Nobody's nodding off to sleep, right? Okay. All right, so we can know that. All right, but now we have to take it another step. Those are things that we might know, either out of experience or reason, but there comes another step in this sense of can we have faith in this chair? We can know things about it, but do we believe that it could support the weight of a 226-pound man? That was my weight this morning. Can we think that that chair could support that much poundage uh, if this man were to sit. Now, you can believe it, okay? I mean, you can say, I know that it's held probably heavy people in the past, and it could probably hold this 200-pound-plus uh, man. We can know that, and you can believe it, right? Well, I want you to know that faith involves a level of knowledge. There are facts that are involved in faith when we read through the scriptures. And we can believe that what the Bible tells us is true, okay? I mean, that's something that we can give assent to. But the real test of faith and what faith is, is whether I sit in that chair and it holds me. It proves itself and I prove myself by trusting in it. Okay, we're just about ready for the test. If I had you kids up here, and I'm not inviting you at this time, but we would begin to do that at some point, but I would have you starting with the lightest weight sitting in there, and then the next one and the next one, ultimately then I'll sit in it, but we're going to skip that first part. I'll give you the chance to sit in this chair after the service. You can come up one by one and do that. But I want to show you that what we know about that chair and what we believe about that chair I don't know, I'm beginning to have doubts. <laughs> but I'm going to give it a try, okay? We're going to see. Oh, oh yeah. I can feel it. Oh, it's just nesting right in. Mm. Kind of comfortable. It kind of like wiggles a little bit. I guess after 200 years, it's going to wiggle a little. But it's really comfortable, uh, at least for me anyway. All right. What is faith? Faith is knowing certain facts, believing them to be true, but then trusting in them. Being willing to take your life and build it upon those facts and those things that you believe. Trusting in them day by day. That's what faith is. It comes down to the fact that what you know and what you believe must be carried out in your everyday life. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the lesson of faith that you have given to us, that you have shown us the truth and offered us the opportunity to live in the light of that truth. Help us, every one of us, to have faith, faith in your word, faith in you, knowing that you are faithful, 
and that you will see us through as we trust in you and we can rely upon you for our everyday lives. For we pray it in Jesus' name, and together we say, Amen. We focus our mission attention today on uh, the land that is just south of our southern border, and that is Mexico. You may not have been aware, because this is a very new ministry for us just in the last couple years, that we've opened up basically a mission field in greater Mexico City. It has expanded out into the countryside to some of the other provinces as well. There are about a half a dozen churches in Mexico now and uh, several preaching points as well. And this came about basically, what can I call it, reverse evangelism. That is that there were people who came here to work uh, in the United States and they came to Christ and got connected with our churches and they had family back in Mexico and under um, Caleb and Christina Acosta, who are leading our Latino ministries, they went down to visit those families and pastors were met and churches were organized and formed and so we've developed a ministry uh, in uh, Mexico. And as you may guess, Mexico, um, <coughs> Uh, you read about it in the news and you only get bits and pieces of it, but you know how uh, the uh, drug cartels and everything, that's what they're fighting against. That and uh, prostitution and so many other things in the culture there uh, that they're fighting against, introducing Jesus Christ and a new way of life to the people there in uh, greater Mexico City and some of the other regions as well. So we want to remember our brothers and sisters in Mexico. Our scripture today is to be found in Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. And I would invite you uh, to turn to the second chapter. We want to look there uh, at the first ten verses. Uh, this passage has to do um, with the new way of life that we have in Christ. We've been talking about this new life in Christ, that's kind of the message of the book of Ephesians. It centers upon that, that idea of how in Christ we've been made new creations, new creatures. And it tells us and teaches us about all that Jesus has done for us. And so I want to begin to read with chapter 2 and verse 1. And if you choose to, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Paul writes these words. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ Jesus even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and sealed us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, and not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. As we focused in the book of Ephesians here, and continue to do so, as I said, this book is about this new life in Christ that is ours. And we've previously talked about in the first chapter about this relationship we have in Christ, that it's in Jesus that we have this hope, and that this power is ours. God's Holy Spirit gives us the strength to live our daily lives. And so it is now Paul begins to elaborate upon what this is all about and the foundations of it here in the second chapter. Um, this new way to live, he starts out with the fact that we were once dead. That is, I, I kind of think of it this way. We were the walking dead. Now, I imagine maybe some of you have seen or heard about that show or whatever, you know. Those that seem to have an appearance of being alive, but they are really are dead. Paul actually is talking about that idea here about how even though we are living in the flesh, in the spirit we have been many times in our former life, we were dead to the spiritual things of God. And so that's what he talks about here in this second chapter as he starts. That we lived in our own worldly, selfish ways. 
Does anyone remember back when, when we talked about sin, and I gave a definition way back when? S-I-N, self-indulgent narcissism, okay? That we were so self-centered, we, we were after our own thoughts, our own desires, satisfy the physical pleasures, that was the nature of what life in the world was like. Now, as we think about that idea, we don't like to think of the fact that when we, before we knew Christ, we were dead, but in reality, we were dead to God's truth and God's purposes in our lives. For some of us, perhaps, we accepted Christ as a young person, and that's wonderful. Others of us, perhaps, it was later in life, and so we have a much larger perspective upon what it is like to, so to speak, fall into the ways of the world or follow the ways of the world. But we need only look around and see how the world is going and how it leads only to, so to speak, death. It does not end in a positive way. It, it brings about an emptiness. And if one fully indulges in the way of the world, it certainly becomes evident rather rapidly. When we were at Central Manor Church, uh, we were involved in a ministry there uh, involved, uh, involving recovery uh, out of drug addiction. And there were many, uh, in that, their particular case, they were ministering to young men. There were many young men who had come out of a drug culture. And you know, it was a very difficult thing for most all of them. That is, is it just kept appealing to them and kept drawing them back. And they had to fight it every day, every day of their life. They had to fight that temptation to fall back into that drug culture. And it's sad to say that some of them did. And a number of those who did so died. Um, a young man that I came to know very well, and I started to tutor and encourage in God's word and whatever. He had been clean for like 18 months, and he thought he was safe. But he went out with a friend, and guess what happened? He OD'd. And I attended his funeral. Broke my heart that that happened to Jake. I know he loved the Lord, and I know he's with the Lord, but the ways of the world draw us downward, downward, downward. A lot of us have played with the ways of the world, and what we don't realize is, in many times, it has made us numb, numb to certain things. We have, in a sense, our sensitivity, our spiritual sensitivity has died. Maybe we have not, like Jake, fallen into the pit and physically died, but we have become numb and insensitive to the things that are going on all around us. And we sometimes, to the point where we do not even realize the danger that it potentially poses for us or for those who are around us. And why is this? Why is this way of the world the way of death? Paul makes it very clear that it is because there is another kingdom at work. If we look around us, here we are as the church. We've just talked about the kingdom of God and what a difference it's making in Mexico, and I could cite other places. You know what Christ has done in your own life and what differences he has made for you. You know how he has transformed things about you, how he has provided you strength in a time of weakness, how he has provided guidance and direction for you when you were uncertain of life path before you. Or in the face of temptation, he's enabled you to have the strength to resist or to turn away, to do what is right as opposed to what is wrong. But there is another kingdom at work. And that is the force of evil that is around us. We perhaps bl turn a blind eye to it, or we don't think about it, or we just, whatever it is, we just don't seem to want to realize that there is, as Paul calls it, the kingdom of the air. That is that invisible kingdom, that one that you're not seeing there, that force of evil or darkness that is out there, uh, that Satan is the ruler of this world, and what his goal is, is to bring down the kingdom of God, to undo the good, to undo you, to undo me. You know, my friends, we can never really consider ourselves fully safe. Yes, we are saved, as we will see in the eighth verse here in Christ, but we are never fully safe from the temptations of Satan never fully safe from the peril that that might involve should we make the wrong choices. Never fully safe. For the ruler, Satan, 
and his spirits would seek to undo us. It is evident if you look around, and you can see the force of evil at work in our world. As I alluded, the drug culture, and it's out there, and what it has done to destroy so many young lives. Or any other subject you might want to talk about. Could we talk about pornography, if you want? Could we talk about the sexual slavery that goes on in America? We can talk about many of these things. The abuse of alcohol. Many, many things that are there. All of this is rooted in the fact that the kingdom of darkness is seeking to overcome the kingdom of light. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, is written in the scriptures. So that we can know that even though we might have a tendency, that we might have a, uh, because of our fallen nature, we might have a leaning to fall into any of these temptations, yet we know greater is he who is in us. Paul is basically reminding these people in the Ephesian church, reminding of them that they used to live in a certain way. They used to have other masters, that is, spiritual masters. But now their master is God, is Christ, and they have been healed by him and given a new hope, a hope for a time and for eternity. He says, you were once the walking dead, which implies this, you are no longer the walking dead. You are the living life. Now, I don't know if that makes any sense at all. But you are really living. When you know Christ, that is to know the fullness of life. Jesus said, I am come that you may have life and you may have it abundantly. As Paul says it here, in beginning in verse 4, he talks about the fact that God made us alive in Christ. We were once dead, but now we are made alive. This is rooted in God's love. You all probably are very familiar with John chapter 3 and verse 16, God so loved the world that what? He gave his only begotten son. Why? So that those who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The summary of the gospel is right there in that one verse. God loves you despite who you were. You don't like to think of yourself as a despicable person, do you? No. I don't think any of us want to admit that, do we? But take a look at some of the thoughts that pass through your mind sometimes. Take a look at some of the emotions that can overcome you in anger and whatever. Think of some times when you've said words that you wish you could retract, but you never did. In the face of a perfect God, we are more than imperfect. We are despicable, if you will. Why should God take any time for you or for me? And yet, he does. Why? Because he loves you. Because you are his special creation. Now you have to meditate on that till the train passes. I'm glad it was a brief one. <laughs> we may have been headed for disaster in life and in eternity when we were without Christ. But we must never forget God loves us despite who we have been and how we have, in a sense, treated him in the past. God's rich, his great love has been demonstrated to us in Christ. His rich mercy is shown to us in Christ. And his great grace, and we will talk more about that in a moment, he has given to us. God loves you, and God has a better life for you and for me. When we follow him and trust in him through Christ, we can find that better life. We can overcome those emotions that would capture us and take us down a path we would not go or want to go. He can capture our minds, as Paul says, take every thought captive. We can do that through God's Holy Spirit and overcome those negative thoughts, overcome those things that when we are alone in ourselves, we would admit even we do not like that part of ourself. God is about transforming you 
and about transforming me. I was a walking dead person, but now I am alive in Christ. I need not give in to those old ways. I can follow Christ and find victory and hope in him. Paul says that God has done this to his own glory. In verse 7, he has done it to demonstrate the riches of his grace to all creation, to all people. He is showing his love, and he is showing his goodness, and he is showing his righteousness. His kindness is the word that Paul uses. His kindness to you and to me. Why is it that I choose to walk in my own ways? I suppose it's just part of how we have all been taught or brought up in the culture. It is perhaps embedded a little bit in the idea of that God has made us with that ability to choose. It's just that we often do not make the right choices. But know this, God does not want you to live in guilt, in shame, or reproach. God does not want that. In fact, I suggest to you, Satan is the author of shame and reproach. Oh, look at you. Who makes you think you're somebody? Why would Christ ever use you? Or how could anybody ever love you? All those kinds of ideas come from the pit of hell, my friends. God's message is one of love, mercy, and grace. I think you have some sense of what love is. But I had to ponder about what, does, what is mercy. Mercy, in my mind is getting what I don't deserve. That's mercy. Getting what I don't deserve. And then I had to think, what is grace and how does it compare with mercy? Well, grace is getting what I don't deserve. Interesting thought, I think. Mercy, getting what, not getting what I deserve, and grace, getting what I don't deserve. God not only has forgiven you, he has empowered you. He has given you his Holy Spirit. He has blessed you. He has not only forgiven you, but he has called you his son or his daughter. He has brought you into his family. God has showed his grace upon you. There's an old definition about grace that's based upon the letters of the word. God's righteousness at Christ's expense. He's given you his love through Jesus Christ. God has made us alive in Jesus. And so as Paul goes on in verses 8, 9, and 10, he says that you can live in this grace. You can be assured of this grace. For it is by grace, that is, it's God's action to save you, to make you one of his own children. It has nothing to do with works. You can't earn it. You can't be good enough for heaven, my friends. You cannot be good enough to find the favor of God. How do we find the favor of God? It's freely bestowed through faith. That is, when we turn to Jesus Christ. It's a gift. And if it's truly a gift, it is a free one. I mean, that's an oxymoron, a free gift, right? I mean, <laughs> it is there for you for the having. God has this gift. It's just available to you by calling upon him in Jesus' name. Lord, I know that I have sinned and fallen short. Lord, I know that I am not perfect. Anyone who looks in a mirror can certainly see that. God, I know that, but I also know that you love me and will forgive me in Jesus Christ. Please come into my life and forgive me and help me to live the life I was born to live, the life you created me to live. We can live a life in grace, and that's a life free from guilt. That's a life free from shame. That's a life free from Satan's authority and power. God has given us grace to live this new life for him. Freely he has bestowed it upon us. As I shared with the children, this faith, it is the means to receive God's grace. It begins by recognizing who Jesus is. It, is, it continues by believing that he can do for you what he has promised to give you a new life. But then it continues with this idea of trust, that you must come and sit in his lap. You must come to him and trust in him. It is about knowing the facts of Jesus. The Bible's clear. It is about believing them to be true, but it is about trusting. I would suggest to you, the devil himself knows the truth of Jesus, and he believes it, but he has not trusted. That's the difference. Faith is trusting in Jesus. 
Paul, or, excuse me, James put it this way. Let me show you my faith by my works. That is, that my faith will be exercised in my daily life. My encouragement from what Paul is saying here is that we all can live a victorious life. We have been saved. That is clear and true by God's grace. And that grace is freely given to you who call upon Jesus. But in that grace, you can live a life of, as Paul describes it, good works. That's an interesting word that he uses there to describe it. It's actually, the idea being conveyed there is the same idea of trust. It's about being a new creation, about being recreated in God and living that life for Jesus. We are his workmanship. God has recreated everyone who comes, so, comes to Jesus so that they may be like Jesus. That is our daily task, my Christian friends, to be more like Jesus. It's a lifelong task, and we seek to live it out. But it can be lived out. We just need to commit ourselves to it day upon day upon day. And that means that as we seek to be like Jesus, we seek to do his good work. We will be created in the image of Jesus. And ultimately, when the promise that is given to us all that those who believe in Christ shall have that eternal home, it will come to pass one day. What is faith? Faith is being sure of what you hope for. Faith is being certain of the things that you don't see. And it is faith that will give you the strength to live your daily life. Faith in God. I talked about putting faith in a chair. We put our faith, so to speak, our trust in a lot of things, don't we? Hmm. But where is the ultimate trust to be placed? Obviously, in Christ. God has a gift for you, for me, and that is the gift of abundant life in Jesus Christ. It is a gift, it is free, this new life, and it's available to you and to me. Our goal, or so, so to speak, our heart's desire should be to seek out that gift day by day. My challenge would be, have you ever received that gift for the first time? I hope so. That's Romans 10, 9, that if you confess Jesus as your Lord and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, the scripture says you will be saved. It's very plain and clear. The promise is there in the 13th verse of the same chapter that anyone who calls upon Jesus can be saved. So what is my response? What is yours? If it is your first time, rejoice in the Lord and come to him and find in him that victory to live, not to be the walking dead, but to be the living live. Or if you've drifted, come back. Come back to Jesus and find in him your strength for daily living. And if you have a desire, maybe you continue to walk with Christ day by day, I hope you have this desire for a deeper commitment. Just come to Jesus every day of your life. And if you are uncertain, but you are still seeking, knowing that there's got to be a better way to live, then my encouragement to you is keep looking to Jesus. He is looking for you. And some point, at some point, you are going to meet. At some point, you're going to meet. Keep seeking Jesus. That's probably the bottom line of what Paul is saying here to all people. The Ephesians here, who were once dead in their trespasses and sins, but to anyone who reads this passage, you need to seek Jesus. God will give you his graceful forgiveness but you need to find it in Christ and only in him. And so for the victory in daily life, it's the same message, turning to Jesus. A new way to live is to live in the pattern of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks for the truth of your word and pray that it might be an encouragement to us and a challenge to us. Lord, we pray that as we focus our lives on Jesus and his teaching, it will guide us in all things in the way that we live, in the way that we treat other people, even in our politics, that as we consider Jesus and his teaching, that that will be the foremost thing in our heart and our life, that we will live out Jesus' principles before this world. And Lord, I pray for anyone out there who may hear this message, who does not know Jesus in that personal way, that day-by-day -day life way, Lord, that they may come to know him so that they may know his transformational power, that they will not be the walking dead, but they will be the living live. Lord, help us to be such people, those who live for you day by day in the things that we do, the things that we say, and the things that we think as well. For in your name we pray it. Amen.
you at home, I pray that you will uh, get your uh, home communion elements at this point. We're going to pause for our time of reflection and focus upon Jesus, our Lord, and how he has given himself for us. And those of you assembled here today near the pavilion, I hope that you have your elements as well, and I invite you to get them at this time. This letter to the Corinthian church tells them that before they partake of the Lord's Supper, they should pause and take a time of personal reflection and prepare their hearts so that they will take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. So let's pray that prayer of confession. Father, we admit it. We are sinners. We have fallen short. That is true. But we know that your grace is sufficient for all, that your forgiveness is complete. And that as we cast our concerns and cares to you and admit and own up to those things in our lives where we've fallen short, we know that your forgiveness is full and free. And we thank you for that and we pray for it in this moment. So that as we come to remember the body and blood of our Lord, that we might do so in a manner worthy of that grace, worthy of that name, the name of Jesus. For in his name we pray. Amen. The scripture says that Jesus blessed the bread and that he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, Take, eat, for this is my body, which is given for you, and as often as you eat this, remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, blessed it and gave to his disciples and he said to them this cup is the new covenant that is given in my blood shed for the remission of many persons sins as often as you drink of it he said remember me As we think about Jesus' body and blood given for us, we see in it the demonstration of his great love, that he sacrificed all for us. And so let us in our daily lives sacrifice for him the things that, well, might keep us from being an example for him, that would hinder our love for him. Let us share him with others by living out his teaching and his principles in our lives. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for the time that we have had to share here today, to hear the words from your word, to sing together in praise, and to share in the Lord's table. And as we conclude our time together here, we lift up the name of Jesus and pray that we may do so in everything that we are and in everything that we have everything that we say and that we do for in his name we pray and to his glory amen let's pray together and now unto him who's able to present you before his presence without failing unto him be honor glory majesty dominion and power now and forevermore amen go in peace my brothers and sisters know that god loves you and he has a great life for you to live for him have a wonderful week